Well, thank you all for joining us today. Uh, we're going to be talking about woody debris, which is um, maybe near and dear to all the hearts of folks who are joining us today. And um, we are, if you have attended River Management Roundtables before, we have begun a slightly different format when you signed up for it. Thanks for signing up. There were a few questions and many people, you know, um, responded to the questions. And our conversation today is going to be pretty much based on your uh, responses to the questions. And then we have a little bit more of information from one of our panelists. So we're trying to replicate the Sunday morning talk shows where we have um, folks who are here who are knowledgeable about river management, but not necessarily here to talk at you. So the idea is for um, your experiences and your questions and any of your input to be the basis of what we're um, talking about today. So, um, hi everyone, I'm Angie Furman. I'm the River Training Center Coordinator for RMS. And just like a, you know, quick overview, Risa mentioned how we're, cha we're changing um, uh, kind of our, our structure of these, but just a reminder, we meet each month to have our river management roundtables, which are virtual conversations. And we are, um, open to everyone who's working on in around rivers to really get those peer-to-peer -peer sharing uh, experiences. And so we've been meeting monthly on the second Tuesday. Just a reminder, and we have a little um, snippet at the end that's going to talk about our April discussion. Just a few quick reminders as we're uh, chatting today, um, just some group norms and agreements about respecting one another. And we're all here to listen, um, kind of share the spotlight though, and speak for yourself, not others. Also really encourage you to be present today if possible and uh, make connections to others. Use the chat box if you haven't found it, but you can open up the chat. Um, we might have some opportunities later on for people to share out their experiences. So I encourage you to explore your Zoom bar there and um, see where you can maybe raise your hand and maybe where your unmute button is because we can call on you to, undo, or to, to unmute. So I think um, Risa is going to take it into our first question. Yeah, and um, I kind of, we slipped, skipped over the, the first slide quickly, but those who are here, as our sort of expert panel and here to um, chime in a little bit and also just to help facilitate the conversation. Thanks, Angie. Uh, Dave Cernicek, who um, is at Bridger Teton National Forest and David Brown, Tennessee Paddle Sports Association and um, a longtime member of the paddling, professional paddling community. Also Liz Lacey um, there, even though it's snowing like cats and dogs in her place, it looks like she's on this nice open green background river scene is the um, works at the park service with the what partnership wild scenic rivers program and um, i'm angie and angie Furman is the river training center coordinator and my name is risa shimoda executive director of river management society so um, we'll zoom back to the questions that we asked you guys when you uh, registered and so which are more, one or more jurisdictions takes responsibility for clearing debris from your river. And the next slide shows what your response was. So it was quite an array and probably reflective of, you know, where you might work. Several federal folks. One really interesting one was I thought was um, Marine Fisheries and the Taunton River Stewardship Council, which is an interesting pair of, of those who take responsibility. A lot of state folks. Um, one person said state parks says that we cannot remove debris, but others, a um, lot of groups of organizations that span regional or watershed groups, some were nonprofits, soil and conservation districts, city, city stormwater departments, quite a few entities who were cited as being responsible for removing debris. And then um, river keepers. Paddlers, Grand River Dam um, on the Illinois River. 
counties and some people said no one or me or mother nature so quite an array um is if there's anyone here who wants to comment on how that how that works we're going to keep on going but if you if you have a comment i would say um we can see how this works if you have something you'd like to say unless there are several people talking on each other just unmute yourself if you'd like and now chime in so this is the variety of jurisdictions that are technically at least responsible for them now we um if we can go to the next slide this this becomes an issue that sometimes um it's a little bit difficult to figure out who decides what to do if there's a lot of debris, unwanted debris, not not debris that's placed for habitat, or it might be um, habitat protection debris that might get in the way for recreation. Similar here, there's a lot more um, citation of federal and state. I mean, sorry, state um, folks who are responsible for decide making decisions, making calls on that, as well as regional or local. And there's at least one livery who indicated they take responsibility for removing debris. And I know that that has, we've heard anecdotally, David has indicated that that, that has happened on, on rivers he's familiar with. Any comments before we, um, go forward on either who is responsible or who makes a call on re removing debris when it gets to a certain level of severity. Maybe you don't know, maybe you're not sure, or maybe you're not comfortable with who is responsible. I guess we can keep on going, Angie. So this is an, uh, this is the third question that we asked, and maybe you, it would be great to get a, some feedback from you guys on this as well. Um, and we were asking about safety incidents that you might have experienced yourself or heard about because of woody deb debris being on your river, whether or not it was placed there or occurred naturally. Go to the responses. So some um, have heard from the Palin community, many, several people said, yes, yes, yes. Um, we would often scatter rivers before long, large long scale paddle trips and remove deadfall. Many times uh, from tubers to experienced kayakers interacting dangerously with wood. There have been many rescues and debris piles only during super high events. And then there's several I was a little surprised, several who said, no, we just have to be careful. Um, it is a hazard, but we haven't heard about it. We've re received complaints, reports of near misses, but I don't know of a, a fatality. I know that concerns for safety are sometimes voiced during the design of woody debris projects, but haven't heard of any um, incidents. So I'd love to hear from anyone your perspective on this, whether or not an event has happened or whether or not the, the likelihood or the possibility of an event has impacted how you have um, approached the possibility of debris buildup like this. Risa, it looks like uh, Ryan says, we unfortunately had a fatality on <clears throat> the Cuyahoga River that was associated with woody debris last week. Um, Ryan, you want to tell us about that? Any any description of what happened or how you dealt with it or how you might not have been able to deal with it? Yeah, thanks, Teresa. Um, so um, Ryan Anger from Cog Valley National Park, uh, River Ranger out there. Uh, like I mentioned, the you know the accident wasn't necessarily caused by the woody debris, but it would resulted in an entrapment of the uh, deceased, unfortunately. You know, uh, it was cold water, wrong type of boats. There was a lot of factors that went into it. Um, the strainer itself that he was caught in was actually something that we would not have targeted for removal. We 
um, with the national park tend to just remove anything that is like a total obstruction of the river, but it did necessitate us going out there to reevaluate that strainer and see if it was uh, at risk of getting worse throughout the season. All right. Thanks. Thanks, Ryan. How about David? You want to just talk about your comment? Several fatalities. It's not good. There, David Brown. Is that David Brown? Yeah. Like you want to describe like the nature of those fatalities or the circumstances, David? Yeah. Um, we've had several in Tennessee related to uh, strainers you know, paddlers, recreational paddlers who, some of whom don't have a lot of experience uh, and don't understand, you know, when the river, the river's bending, a turning, you're gonna, the, the boat's gonna go to the outside of the current right into the debris pile. And so, um, but there have been several tragic fatalities. Uh, one of the most recent was a 15 year old young girl who was paddling with her parents. Uh, and uh, it not non-commercial. It was private, but um, you know, not really familiar with the circumstances. The water was actually too high for them to be out there. But, and I think that's one of the points uh, that it's not really on the agenda. But uh, to what extent can we educate uh, some of these, especially recreational kayakers, are going to Tractor Supply or? Walmart and buying a $200 boat and then, you know, putting in without the requisite experience or understanding of the risk, uh, which, you know, don't really appear to be that great initially until, you know, something like that happens. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Was that just a question on that gal? Was it high water? Yeah, it was, that was, that event was high water, but, mm -hmm. uh, and, um, uh, in fact, the outfitters that run that stretch of river were not operating because of the, the water level was higher than they would uh, operate on commercially. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks. Derek, you had your hand up. Yeah, thank you. Um, and I'm happy to be joining you guys today. This is my first round table. Um, so far, I am I'm surprised by the tone and topic of this wood because over the last decade or more I've seen and heard a lot of conversations about large wood framed very positively usually and that's kind of ecosystem-wide geomorphically hydrologically it is and as you identified um, like it's using a lot of restoration projects often if the wood falls in the river, awesome, leave the large wood. Don't call it debris because that has negative connotations. Um, and so I'm kind of struck by um, this special situation when we have people in the river, I mean, everything changes, right? And we want to uh, prioritize safety, education, avoidance of any mishaps. And so kind of differentiating where we can have kind of unrestrained wood across the channel, in the channel, large wood jams um, versus where we do need to clean the rivers, manicure the rivers for recreationalists, kind of prioritizing that over the more natural historical um, hydrogeomorphic processes. That's, that's a conundrum. So I just wanted to <laughs> speak up and introduce that. So thank you. Yeah, we were wondering if there would be fish scientist people attending because <laughs> it is it is conundrum. It's a it's a contradiction, actually. In in many cases, environment endangered species act here, maybe wild well, scenic rivers here, and they're they're not agreeing in what, what's most appropriate. Liz, go ahead. Should I tell my little story? Yeah, I won't name the state because I don't want to <laughs> get anybody in trouble. But I work with a state that had. The uh, fisheries biologists working with, um, you know, with trying to get more large wood into the stream for fish habitat purposes, and then the counterpart at the same state uh, level was uh, into recreation and trying to clean the wood out of the river. And so, two state departments were actually acting at odds with each other, 
and um, calling the wood different things, as you you just said, Derek. You know, there were some people who called it large wood, large woody habitat. In fact, as opposed to large woody debris. So um, it's interesting, even within one state and one state um, environmental agency, there were very very different attitudes towards it. And what was, how did you resolve it? You mentioned sort of, did you come to a truce? Ah, well, you know, our, our Wild and Scenic um, Partnership Group on the river, uh, everyone would come to us and try to get us to resolve things. But actually, we just told them to go back to work with each other. And we suggested that um, that there was a way to use the wood. Um, maybe in certain instances, it shouldn't be across the river. It shouldn't necessarily be in a dangerous setting, but um, that we could have um, folks from the state actually push it towards the bank, put it into different areas where you know the river was wide enough to accommodate both recreationists and, and fish populations and all that. So yeah, we were trying to work with them so that they would kind of coordinate between each other um, and get on the same page. And um, I don't think we've succeeded in getting the terminology changed. I think they still have the same kind of outlook on this. But um, but I do think they are working more together, um, and and the rec folks aren't taking out the the wood that the fisheries biologists had put in on purpose for habitat reasons. Mm -hmm. So that was that was good. Yeah, thanks, Liz. I see from Carl. Um, I understand this highly managed area that might be removed by higher flows anyway, and I err on the side of safety. I might not remove it from the river so, so much as disengage it for the shore. Oh, to let it go down, to let it get washed down. Yeah, anyone else? Any thoughts? Uh, ooh, is that something? Hey, <clears throat> my name is William. I'm the, the ACA rep, the state director for North Carolina. I'm attending and I uh, appreciate y'all having me. Um, because this is something that recently came up with me, I was contacted by National Park Services um, in relation to log and woody debris and paddle trails across North Carolina. Um, so that sent me on this investigation, I guess you could call it, across the state, trying to find out what the different entities across North Carolina do. And I've came across the same thing that you're talking about right now is the conservation piece versus the paddle and the recreational piece versus the safety piece. Um, and you mentioned that the two state entities um, kind of at head of each other versus their what their goals are. And I think that's where ACA really becomes a, a force multiplier in this whole process because we're not, we're all of those. We're all for conservation, we're for safety and we're for the recreational. Um, and so I've been kind of on the quest to try to find a program that does set up um, uh, expectations and, and criteria to remove the debris, whether it's conservation, ecological, the safety, the paddle trail, the recreational of that, that location, and which is the best scenario, but having criteria and also training programs for the people that train it, that remove it. Because as you said in the beginning slides, um, a lot of times it's just that lonely little paddler that had his kayak from Dick's Sporting Goods, like you mentioned, that's going out there with his little chainsaw trying to cut this out. We know that's not safe. So trying to develop that in North Carolina to the point where if I see someone posting, hey, we need to remove this, I can take that and say, hey, we have a system that we contact appropriate people to evaluate, even decide if that needs to be removed and what the criteria are for that. So I think ACA is a good avenue for the other states as well to really kind of try to help funnel and, and put this together. Pretty cool. It would be great. Dave, do you want to respond or I was going to ask? Well, I think in, in terms of the types of uh, situations that, you know, you kind of categorize woody debris, uh, very often they're not natural situations. When wood piles up around a bridge pier, for example, uh, or when, you know, we've seen people cutting timber uh, and it falls into the river. Uh, so there are a number of situations like that that, you know, our, our folks have encountered that are not natural events. And so that, I think that's when you, uh, and especially when they, they pose a risk to the public 
whether fishermen or uh or recreational paddlers i think that's uh certainly a, an event that uh, where you know you could kind of categorize that uh type of de uh, debris pile as something worthy of removing and then the other circumstance i think is that even a lot in tennessee most of the rivers or a lot of the rivers are stocked with uh non-native fish and that's not inappropriate but uh it's kind of hard to argue that it's inappropriate to remove woody debris uh, in those circumstances. Uh, so I think, you know, it's kind of a trade-off. You certainly want to help uh, the fishery, but if there is some woody debris that's life-threatening, I think that uh, certainly has to be taken into account. Um Thanks, David. So, Monica, you want to unmute and talk about um, your comment here? So, Verde River. Yeah. Sure. I did a lot of typing, I guess. Um, so, back when I worked on the Verde, and it's Wild and Scenic River, I wasn't honestly too familiar with the management plan as I was, I was just working in the field. But it is sort of a ribbon of habitat in the desert but it grew in so thick because it hadn't flooded in so long that the Phragmites would grow in and the trees would start bowing over the river and fall in that you would not be able to pass it unless we maintained it. So that is what we did there. That was the management direction there. Um, it seems to be different on a lot of rivers I've been on. Like the Lower to Chutes has a great example on four chutes. There's an area where all the current goes to one spot where there's almost always a log. Personally, I think when the hazard is that easy to um, get yourself into, it might be worth taking out the wood. But it seems to me that it it is depends on the manager making the decision whether you know there's a lot of risks to take in into account. Like if you remove one piece of wood, does that mean you have to remove all the other pieces of wood? And then you have to take into account the benefits of the wood. And I assume that would qualify as a water resources project. And if it's wild and scenic would qualify for a section seven determination. Um, I guess the point is it would probably depend on each scenario. Like the Metolius River is a great example where there's so much wood there that people very rarely even boat the lower section anymore because you have to portage multiple times and it's quite hazardous and is very difficult in a raft. And so essentially what could be maybe even a commercial run down to the lower section of Metolius isn't run anymore because there's so much wood, but there's also a strong argument that the wood supports excellent habitat for the fisheries. So I think Metolius River is maybe the opposite example of, of the Verde River and that they're not maintaining at all downstream for recreation, whereas the Verde, they are. So it seems like we just have a vast array of what we're all doing. So thanks. Um, there probably is something that's tied to management plans of whatever's in the plan is approved, establishes the priority, um, but it might not be obvious to anyone if you're just at the river. Um, or intending to or hoping to use it as a boater saying. So um, speaking of kind of uh, policy or management plans, Dave Cernicek has generously offered to share, um, I'll let him describe it, but a, pl a plan for in the Wichita National Forest on the Snake River about woody debris. So there, there is a plan and just go ahead and take it away, Dave. This might help eat, regardless of who you work for, who does manage the river, or even if it's unclear who, who is responsible for, for woody debris. Okay, I'll be happy to do that. Um, for me, it was uh, in, when, once we had our designation, we were doing our CRMP for our, our wild and scenic designation. Uh, I thought that would be a great time to try and get a handle on all the stuff that, that we kibitz about and try and figure out when do we cut, do we cut, um, do we remove things, do we not, where, you know, where's that line in the sand? And uh, that's that's why I decided to uh, try and try and put together a, a 
large woody debris policy that we put in our plan. And uh, I'll try and talk just mainly today about having a, a large woody debris policy, no matter what your river or where you have it, that type of thing is, is, is kind of finding out your place in the sand where um, you are going to do something or not do something. Um, let's go slide. Um, just, uh, I'm Bridger Teton National Forest is in the western part of Wyoming. It's that big green glob there, 3.4 million acres, lots of wilderness, lots of rivers, headwaters, the green, the snake, and the Yellowstone rivers. Let's go slide. Um, okay, so all these different colorful rivers are part of our, our huge wild and scenic designation. It's 415 miles. The um, Bridger Teton National Forest manages 315 miles of that. That's that's my job. Uh, if you see those little blue ones down at the bottom of the screen, that's our recreational rivers. And that's where we have a lot of human traffic. And that's mainly where we're talking about anything having to do with um, removing woody debris from the river. Otherwise, um, it stays. Slide. Why have a policy? Um, because we don't want to end up like a ski area. Um, if you ever notice, you don't ever see um, many articles in the newspaper about people suing ski areas because all you have to do is file one and say something happened to you and they'll pretty much settle with you. Um, ski areas got into the business years ago of marking hazards. And so they have to mark every hazard that they have. You mark one, you got to mark them all. And you don't ever want to be legally, you don't ever want to be in that world of anything that can hurt something has to have a sign on it. Um, and you don't want to be in that world where anything that could somebody could get hurt on on your river has to have a sign or a warning or ha you have to tackle these people before they push out onto the river and tell them about these hazards. Slide please. Um, so what I wanted to get in the business of is having a policy that um, everybody knows, all parties involved know what we do, um, puts us in a better place of, you know, we have a line when we cut, why we cut, how we cut, whatever. We remove things for a very few certain conditions. And uh, that's, that's uh, it's well-defined. Uh, there's been things in the past that had happened in this river program, 80s and 90s that were atrocious, where like they had search and rescue come to participate in uh, getting people, just a parked boat at the bottom of a lunch counter to help people that didn't make it through the rapid. Um, generally, you need to take the river on the river's terms. We don't want to make it safer for anybody or make it easier for people that don't have the skills to be on the river. Slide, please. Um, so large woody debris, uh, define it. Logs that are at least 10 centimeters in diameter, one meter in length. Um, must be at least partially contained in the obvious high water channel to be considered large woody debris. For the purpose of this CRMP, the diversity of stream sizes within the designation, large woody debris is considered native plant material of any dimension that could be that could provide slide please. Um, all the good things about slide please woody debris, bank stabilization, sediment, filtration, nutrients, decreased stream velocity, modified microclimate, wildlife habitat, connectivity and aquatic habitat condition for fish. Uh, large woody debris is really, really good for our rivers and it shouldn't be something we tear out of there just, just for fun and games. Slide please. Okay, so pretty much our rule is large woody debris occurring in the Snake River head otters will remain in place in all cases, period, kind of. Um, except uh, removal may be considered under the following conditions. We have conditions because not all, you know, I've seen other river management areas where people will not remove large woody debris in all cases. And it's not a good thing when you leave a big hairy man killing log out in the middle of the main channel just to kill people because of wild and scenic or doing the right thing or providing habitat. Not a good thing. Uh, gives well and scenic a bad name, gives you a bad name. Don't leave something out to kill people that is obviously going to kill somebody and not in the best interest of, of being a good river manager. Slide, please. So human induced sources of debris, uh, not necessarily a van, but if there's something that clearly 
is obvious that we wouldn't have this debris here, that everything's hung up on except for something that happened uh, that's due to man, the hand of man, then, then that's a possibility that we can take it out. Um, agricultural practices, bridge work, um, ramping water levels from the dam. On the snake, we have the dam that goes up and down. They don't ramp as much as they used to. Uh, if it's diversions, anything like that, that we can say, yeah, uh, that put these lo that log in the water, that put this van in the water, whatever. Um, we can consider it if it's a human-induced source. Uh, that gives us a little bit of leeway. Slide, please. Uh, percentage, when it gets into recreational areas, um, as I said, the snake and the hoback are pretty much the only places that we do any any removal. Percentage of the channel blockage. Debris may be removed if uh, managed for downstream travel outside a designated wilderness when more than two thirds of the stream is impounded with the main flow pulling water through debris with literal with little or no option for safe passage or portage. OK, so if there's no way around this sucker and people are going to just float into it, this is a tight bend in the river. This is called Sherry's and, uh, you know, big flat rock on the right. And you just kind of get a good push to the left there. Um, yeah, if it's going to force people into it and it's it's, it's going to drown them, then, yeah, we're going to we're going to really strongly consider moving that uh, slide, please. Finally, we have obscured hazards. Debris may be removed if if hidden, unavoidable, in a roaded area, highly difficult to portage, likely to entrap a human on a frequently paddled stretch of class two through four section of water. Um, this is also on the hoback. You come around a bend and boom, there's a log in front of you. Uh, you can't get left of it. If you try and go right, you're in more logs. Um, if people don't have a chance to see it or there's no way to react in time to deal with it, we're going to pull it out of there. Um, that's that's our option there. Slide, please. Finally, we have we have more on this that doesn't go into logs. It's about other things, but critical infrastructure. Uh, we left ourselves some room for uh, not losing critical infrastructure. I don't know how well your agencies are funded. Ours are not that mine is not that great. If we lose a bridge, we're probably not going to have a new bridge for five to ten years. If we get a new one at all, we're not going to sit. <clears throat> patiently and, and watch a bridge get washed away that we can't replace that's going to separate people from their homeland their home property or their ranch or their business or anything like that we're going to um we're going to go ahead and and try and release that pressure and and not lose a critical piece of infrastructure or lose the highway those types of things um we can do that and we've written it up that we can do that um most likely if, if highway departments involved are going to do it anyways and even if it's against our rules and we're going to end up embarrassed so we do have we gave ourselves a little bit of leeway to to deal with that type of stuff um slide please so um our policy does require that we use the the minimum tool possible um to deal with uh woody debris um for us you know Getting getting to things before they even become a woody debris in the middle of your channel is is best. Um, I can go out in the fall and I know who's going to be in the water next year. Um, if I can work in low water or no water conditions, that's a lot better than put it, trying to suspend people over uh, bridges or anything like that or getting in the water. Um, always make sure you buck if you're going to buck up a tree, buck it into as tiny little pieces as possible. You know, we take all the branches off and then cut them into small sections that float down the river and go on down to the reservoir and end up wherever, Idaho. Um, instead of trying to send a whole tree down river that's just going to get hung up in another rapid and, and create a new hazard. Slide, please. Um, if we are working out over the water, we do it. We do it quite a bit. Um, we have a pretty good system. We have certified sawyers, usually from fire, that work with us. They're in full PPE for cutting and for water immersion. They do wear a rescue PFD, and, and we do use the live bait system. Uh, we deploy upstream and downstream um, safety people, one to look for traffic and, and warn, us if, warn us if anything's coming downstream. Uh, we also have you know downstream safety in case the uh, the cutter ends up in in the drink and is separated from the live bait rope. Um, you know, the more people you have available, the the more intricate you can get with your safety. But um, we do use a lot of safety debris um, when we're doing these types of operations. 
slide, please. Um, obviously, if we're going to cut from a boat using search and rescue's boat that's not inflatable, works a lot better. And sometimes, you know, we don't cut it right where it is in the middle of the rapid. We we cut it free and, and we got to corral it down into an eddy and bucket into much smaller, much smaller pieces. Um, and slide finally. Um, the biggest tool possible is is uh, a little bit of dynamite. If you have something that is just going to suck people into it when the water goes through it, and you have too much wood burn up, and it's too dangerous to have your Sawyers go in there and cut it up for you. Slide, please. And that's basically it for our, our large woody debris policy. Um, basics: what you will cut, when you'll do it, where you'll cut it, how you'll do it, when you won't. And as I said, our policy mainly is leave it in the water, leave it, our large body debris stays in in the streams on about 20, uh, what, 23 of our streams, we don't touch large woody debris anywhere. Only our high use streams where we have a lot of boat traffic, we have a lot of inner tubes, we have a lot of stupid people, we have a lot of alcohol drinking um, that we do stuff on. And that's it for me. Thanks so much. Um... Any other any comments? We will um, definitely. We're recording this, and we'll post the recording when we're done. We have it on our River Training Center YouTube channel for Coral. Liz yeah. asks, "Is there any consultation with fisheries folks?" Derek, are you catatonic at this point, listening to this? Yeah, Derek's, Derek's in the fetal <laughs> position. Um, yeah, there's a few comments here. Um, let's see. I don't know where they start, though. Oh, we've got through quite a few of them. Um, OK. Where does it start with, Ryan? Let's see. Well, Monica, let's see. Monica, I wonder if there are some Section 7 determination examples for woody debris removal. Uh, we, it's it's not a section seven thing. We're not digging in. We're not digging into the bed of the river. We're not removing anything from the bed of the river. Usually these are um, technically, I guess we are working. You know, this is never something that's even rung the bell for for um, something. It's it's not a construction project. It's not a water resources project. No, it does not right. does not fit the bill for that uh, whatsoever. And then Liz. This is a great question. Do you use the wood elsewhere in the river? It's probably good responses to that. Um, you know, most of the time that that wood wants to get get away from us as quick as possible. Occasionally, we uh, you know I'll cable it if it looks like it's going to run on us. You know, I will cable the wood um, with a choker and and to another tree that's still standing, and and so we can at least bring it to the side of the river while we uh, bucket up. I do notice that some of our landowners along the river will. Um, cable trees so that they end up along their banks and help preserve their banks. Um, I don't make much comment, any comments about that. That usually helps those, you know, while that tree's in up along their banks, it seems to collect a lot of uh, um, a lot of silt and start building up their banks a little bit more with the tree intact um, along their banks. But uh, no, we haven't used those trees anywhere else. We have plenty more tree, plenty of trees anywhere we want to use them. So Lulia asks, when is woody debris not good for the river? Possible examples include trees are falling into the river, which used to be paddled before it was so clogged. The roots are really eroding the bank. This is a natural phenomenon. Happens to be, oh, in one case, happens to be a historic towpath. Walkers and paddlers are both out of luck. Should it be addressed or just let it run its course? I don't know. Anyone have an opinion on that? Really, where is this, or what towpath is this? If you're there, get my unmute button off. Hi, everybody. Hi. Um, in Rhode Island, and it's a state park, um, but this historic towpath goes along it. And trees are there, clogging up the. Oh, river it's and it's a complete jumble. Yeah. So the state park manager said he used to go out there himself and cut them. And then somebody higher up at the state level said, ooh, that's dangerous. You have to stop doing that. So it's just been accumulating for years now. Mm. Oh, because of liability for the staff? Probably, Probably. yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. This so is her. 
great Michigan um, on the, in the Rouge River watershed. Um, if I could chime in, we, we, this is really kind of the impetus for the creation of our water trail was the amount of woody debris that was clogging the lower Rouge River, um, seeing that it was the only tributary of the, the Rouge that had water levels high enough to sustain paddling. So we had to have an aggressive plan and approach for managing woody debris on the lower Rouge. Um, you know, and it kind of encompasses uh, two different processes. One is fun, funded and managed by our county. Um, where they go in, they actually will use heavy equipment to remove uh, some of the larger log jams, more dense log jams um, on, on our waterway. And then we coordinate groups of volunteers um, to go in um, and assist as well. We, we, we do have a couple people who are experienced Sawyers, no one certified. I was really uh, curious about what that means, what a, the Sawyer certification means, whether they're certified to work with chainsaws and water. Um, and also I'm curious about um, who's ensuring um, your workers doing uh, woody debris. Um, our volunteers are covered under our um, our general uh, policy, but contractors, because we've tried to promote this as a workforce development opportunity on our water trail, um, because it's a perpetual uh, problem. And the challenge is, is getting uh, the workers insured um, because there's no category or classification for woody debris management. So they're being charged for uh, as if they're trimming trees over a house um, or, you know, other circumstances that y y the premium is just way too high in order to do the type of work that we're looking for. So has anyone solved the insurance conundrum um, with, with management? Who does offer any type of certification um, for this work or license to do with you management? Okay. I work for the Forest Service. So we, we have our internal fire crews. Okay. They're, so, uh, you know, everybody has certifications that can cut something. And uh, so we have certified Sawyers. Um, outside of that, if I, if I didn't have our in-house folks, um, my volunteer fire department also has certified cutter cutting people and we're insured by the county. And uh, I've definitely in times where I haven't been able to get the fire crew out, I use the fire department. Um, I haven't really gone to ask for it. We just do it for training um, purposes and uh, get it done at night. And we do it for our training hours and we get the, you know, get the uh, hazard out of the way so we can not have um, emergency calls there. Yeah, a few years ago at one of our river management symposiums, uh, a couple of folks from Minnesota DNR came and mm -hmm. actually conducted a, they were out there with chainsaws doing a, a sample, tiny bit of a, a bit of a training, but they had an exhausted, exhaustive manual on that training. And it was both to um, remove it or it was creating a problem and relocating it for habitat purposes. I'd be happy that to share that. It's really great. Yes. And the other one it, with that with Minnesota was they train Sawyers how to cut from boats. Yes. So, yeah. you know, so you're in the moving system already. So it's mm. pretty technical. There's also a great tool that is, it's like a pruner, but it's, uh, you know, it's on a long, it's on a long pole for pruning, but it's got like a little, little chainsaw piece at the end that you use. So you can be like hanging over the boat, but not as far as you would be with, with a, uh, a chainsaw, but you can be in the boat and going over and, and sawing on things that aren't exceptionally big and, and really making progress with those without huge exposure to a person like bending over with a chainsaw. Yeah. But, uh, well, if there was a suggestion that I could make, um, you know, to this group, it would be, you know, to coalesce the experience of the various river managers uh, who are doing large woody debris or who have uh, various training programs, um, to, to coalesce them under some umbrella and create a license or certification for woody debris management. I think it would be very advantageous um, for river managers and, you know, one, just being able to talk about this work, to train this work, um, you know, uh, as, as a standard. Um, and I, I just see some advantage in that. And I think it's certainly something that's doable um, with the amount of folks who have a, a background experience and where we're to get it done. Yeah, Angie, new program area. The Training Center. No, and it's important, and um, Herman, for to to think that this issue was part of the basis for you know the early part of your the um, Friends of the Rouge work, and is I didn't I didn't know. So it's it's definitely a need, and I think that 
the work has been kind of siloed in the states so much. We haven't talked, you know, between states. So thanks for that suggestion. Yeah, it's interesting too, even just thinking about the differences in the types of uh, waterways that we're working on. Um, looking at the images uh, from the, the gentleman who, with the National Forest Service, it looks like a very wide river with rapids and that is the complete antithesis of the Rouge, which is very narrow, um, you know, mm -hmm. flashy river, you know, and that's the, the, the impetus for our um, Woody debris, you know, is the, the, the high rise um, of uh, water levels during heavy rains and, you know, bank erosion and they just collapse in. So two very different circumstances creating woody debris hazards, um, mm -hmm. but still, still the issues regardless. Mm -hmm. One thing I've started working with a bit is um, a baby excavator. Um, I've got an operator who can get into places without doing damage, if I can get him in. Uh, he can do really neat stuff without taking the entire thing out and having straight cut off logs. He can break things off and, and do a lot uh, to leave some habitat and make it look like there hasn't been, you know, stuff specifically cut out there. Um, it's, it's a tool that I haven't used a lot yet, but I like what it does because um, I can leave habitat there and I can leave it so it doesn't look like we've been in there working. Um, but also something that works really well. It's got to have a thumb on the end of it to pick things up and move them around and break them. But also really, I, I think it's a tool with a, a lot of good, good possibilities. For sure. And I could just add this last thing. Um, Wayne County here in Michigan has actually deployed a, a spider crawler um, into the to, to retrieve and, and pull out logs as well. So uh, we've seen some pretty uh, innovative strategies and approaches to, to, to managing wood on our river. And in, in any way that we could, we'd be open to sharing them. Yeah, thanks. Um, hey, Heather, you want to describe the situation that you have in your chat, what you're planning to do, maybe even um, to Herman's question, who's funding it, what you'd like to achieve this year? Sounds like you have a towpath. Sure, thanks. Yeah, we um, we have a towpath in a local park that hasn't been managed in many years. So we, um, I'm with a nonprofit kind of um, putting together all the jurisdictional partners for a project. So we're actually getting the whole canal studied to make sure it really is um, still in good shape. It's from the late 1700s. Um, so we're really just doing a whole study. You know, we have a lot of, um, debris growing up on the banks, right? So do we need to start cutting trees off the bank of the canal to keep it viable? Um, but yeah, we have probably about 20 trees, you know, above and underwater um, that need to be cut. A paddler just went out and he said he could, you know, barely get under them. But it used to be a really popular paddle route for folks so they could paddle up the canal, put in into our river, you know, do the rapids and kind of make this, this really cool loop in our area where you didn't need a car to, um, to do a great paddle loop. So we're really hoping to open that back up for folks in our area. But again, it's a partnership with nonprofit and local parks in this instance. Mm -hmm. so, working together, sounds good. Uh, let's see, Jared, so Minnesota DNR. Yeah, I'm trying to look to see if I can find the materials that they provided, but Minnesota DNR's program might've been like an internal um, training, whether or not they did an official certificate, I don't know, but it's pretty exhaustive classroom, um, homework, and field certification. Yeah, I might have some other stuff. Mm -hmm. John, what's the pole chainsaw? John Newman. You're getting te into technical terms here. Oh, I'll answer. That's what he okay. was explaining. The chainsaw on the whole long. Yeah, pole. that's what Dave was trying to come up with. Oh, 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 oh right. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, if you want to describe what you are talking about, also with excavator. Oh yeah, I was just seconding uh, David's comment there on the the utility excavator. Um, we've started using that more in in recent years, attaching a chain to to the thumb on the ex excavator. Um, and then we can cut out a 12 to even up to 16 foot, depending on the diameter of the log um, section, and then haul that whole log up onto the bank and then bucket on shore. And that just means fewer cuts over the water um, for the river rangers and the fewer cuts they're making straddling a log out over current 
um, the safer they are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks, that sounds good. Hey, Jim, and then Orion. Yeah, hi, thanks. Um, I, I think the enthusiasm about how we um, share information about techniques um, for removing wood um, can be really beneficial. Um, I'm also thinking that um, a little more conversation about how and when and why we're removing wood might be valuable. Um, it's uh, large wood plays a really important role in uh, stream and river function, not just for ecology, but in terms of um, getting flows up onto floodplains and that kind of thing. It feels like there's, um, if the wood poses a safety risk, that may be a compelling reason to remove it. Um, but sometimes I think we may get um, a little eager about removing wood. Um, that's more a question of convenience or opening opportunities where um, none would naturally exist. Um, typically wood is recruited to channels through natural processes, either bank erosion or um, ice uh, storms or wind throw or uh, just mortality due to disease. And it plays a really critical function in streams. It's um, apart from boulders, it's one of the largest um, channel forming um, elements in a river system. And I think we owe it to ourselves to, to think about its place there and to, and to um, balance some of those factors. I would uh, like to second that. Again, this is our Hermie Jenkins calling from, I'm not from Detroit. Um, we certainly think about, um, you know, removing wood in our river in an environmentally friendly way. Um, we use what the methodology called uh, cleaning and opening uh, log jams where we try and remove as much floating wood as possible um, and cut a six to eight foot path to allow passage for canoes or kayaks. Um, but for the most part, where we can, we try to leave uh, wood that's affixed to the bank, the river bank or to the river bed um, in place. And it actually will require a state permit um, to be removed um, otherwise. Um, so yeah, it, you know, it's, it's habitat for fish and other wildlife um, throughout the watershed. So yes, it's very important, I think, to, uh, to think about um, managing wood in the river in an environmentally friendly way. Thanks, Herman. How about Orion, you had your hand up. Yeah, thanks, Risa. Thanks, everybody. Orion Hatch with the Snake River Fund, also up in Northwest Wyoming. And I just wanted to chat um, or just bring up the role that our organization plays when it comes to woody debris. We don't really have a hand in, in removing um, obstructions, but what we do have a role in is disseminating that information to the public. You know, we have hundreds and hundreds of miles of navigable water, and not all of it is um, roadside. Um, so we rely on our community to, um, you know, gather information um, about, you know, what's out there um, and we encourage our constituents to take photos. Um, Dave Cernicek and, and other folks on the forest are great resources as well, um, where we can have information about what stretches are navigable and what are not, have them funneled to us. And I'll link in the chat um, a river conditions map that we publish and maintain. It's not accurate right now because nobody's floating. Um, but, you know, it has everything from um, CFS, uh, boat ramp status to potential debris. And we're really, we're really careful to not, you know, give, kind of getting back to that ski resort argument. We're not giving people advice. We're just letting them know what's, what's out there. So I think that's an important part of this conversation as well as making sure that the public is as well informed as possible so that they can make the decisions they need to stay safe on the river. Thanks, Orion. Any other thoughts? Um, or you had a question that's sort of like something that someone mentioned before. Does uh, wood removal using heavy equipment require Section 7? So it's not a water resources project, but maybe Dave or another Wild Senior River Manager could talk about just the issue of um, uh, sending heavy equipment into the river. What you um, have to do with that? I don't put I don't put heavy equipment into the river. If we can reach it from the bank, we will. Um, if we can pull it, you know, as I said, when I do um, work on the bank or 
work with wood, I, I wait till it's late fall and we're down to, you know, hundreds of CFS if, if that's the most. Um, I do a lot of work in the fall for, for these types of things. If I can find that wood actually out of the water, then it doesn't fall within any policy. And uh, going back, we do only, you know, we're only removing wood from 30 miles of a 350 mile designated wild and scenic system. Um, but yeah, we don't, we don't play in the channel. We don't try and touch much if we're going out there, but uh, yeah, we will not really be driving in the channel or digging in the channel or pulling things, you know, we will pull, we will pull up on trees and move them out, but we're, we're really not working in the channel at all. Uh -huh. And, you know, it, it's, things got to be something deadly as I went through, it's got to meet our policy. It's got to, it's got to block more than two thirds of the channel. It's got to be unavoidable. It's got to be, you know, something that in a high high traffic channel that's that's going to hurt people if you can get around it we've got rivers that are full of wood that you can kind of pick your way through they don't have much current and so those keep those keep their wood in them um because the wood can stay there it's not going to kill anybody it's just our high use rivers where we have you know two hundred thousand people in a season go down that's where we get excited about not having people dead um uh, it's just on a will it, you know this isn't just i don't like the look of it i don't like wood in the middle of the channel i'm taking it out we it's got to really be have potential to do some do some dangerous things to people. I really yeah. like that that framework, Dave, um, of thinking about if we can differentiate like where is wood a danger versus where is wood inconvenient, and then if differentiating those two things, that then informs our management because if if you know it's a slow stretch of river where we have to get out and portage around a down log like yeah that's an inconvenient but that's experiencing the ecosystem and that's allowing that river to be a river um whereas if we the more we clean it up the more wood we take out the more we're like managing it as a recreational facility a, a play park for people which <laughs> i know we want to do that some but um you know people incurring some inconveniences out in nature um, is, is something yeah. that we can deal with too. So the more groups and the more, I think, widespread a framework like yours can be adopted, that 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 there's some win-win in there. That's why we went with, you know, everything is fish habitat. We're keeping it all except for these few conditions. Um, and cool. yeah. Ryan, let's take one last question. I'm going to ask Angie to go forward and maybe settle on the. We have a survey slide to get your input on today's session. So me, Ryan? Yeah, yeah, oh, go for it. Yeah, sorry. I was thinking about this, but you asked earlier. I, the one question or situation that has eluded me, I haven't been able to find an answer to, is how much weight debris should we have? And I know it's going to vary based on different river sizes and things, but. Um, It'd be really great to have some perspective. So we're in an urban watershed, uh, not a ton of forests, but there's a lot of erosion. So are we getting enough woody debris into our system from the excessive erosion that we have in a limited natural area? Um, should we be adding woody debris? How long should a, should a what, what, how, how stable, I guess, should these log jams be? So I, if you guys have any resources or know of any uh, resources to point me toward, that'd be really helpful to understand how much should we have because we might be at or above our goal given the amount of erosion and situations that we're, we're sitting at but maybe that's not the case in order to add more yeah. hi i wonder if i could inject a couple of things yeah it was a very good slide talk and i really appreciate this discussion overall it's very good um i i thought i thought i'd make a couple of comments that uh um, you know, in 1899, Congress passed the Rivers and Harbor Act. Part of that was, uh, part of that, uh, there was a section called the Refuse Act, which, which actually covers uh, some of our discussion here. And uh, that act was uh, reinvigorated in 1966 by the Supreme Court in a case of the United States versus Standard Oil Company. And it kind of set up a, an issue all foreign substances were disallowed uh, without an Army Corps of Engineers permit. 
the whole idea of the Rivers and Harbors Act was to keep navigable water. Especially in the West, there were uh, many timber companies that used the rivers to float the timber to the mill. And you would have log jams. And of course, the, uh, you'd have to bust up the log jams with the you know, dynamite them. Uh, you know, that's still done in some of the national parks. Like, if, you know, if you the horse dies on a trail in Yosemite, uh, they're going to set off a charge to dispose of it. Uh, anyway, the uh, <laughs> um, there, there's well, that, a, yeah. Thanks, Bud. Thanks, Bud. We're going to have to cut it short a little because we're at the end of the hour. But sure. I want to thank everyone uh, so much. We've got more trainings coming up from the River Training Center, uh, Wild Saint Rivers Values. If you go to the um, the training center, you'll see that. And then we have another round table next month. We're going to be talking about nonprofit groups, how to stay relevant and healthy when everybody's chasing the same money. So um, look for a notice about that. And um, thanks. I'm sorry if we didn't get to all the questions, but I want to be uh, mindful of everyone's time. So thank you so much, everyone. Appreciate your being here. Thank Don't you. be stranger. Thank you.